Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. An old timer was sitting on the riverbank. He, he was obviously waiting for a nibble. And although the fishing season had not started yet, though, there was a uniformed officer standing right behind him. Stood there for several minutes. Finally, the old timer inquired, are you the game warden? Yep. The unruffled, the old man just kind of sat in the shore and waved his fishing rod back and forth, <clears throat> pulled it up. And finally he says, I'm just, there's a little minnow on there. I'm just teaching him how to swim. Mark Twain once spent a pleasant three weeks in Maine in the woods, but now was on his way home. As he was making himself comfortable on the train on the way back to New York, a sour-faced New Englander sat down beside him. And he struck up a conversation. Been to the woods yet? The stranger had asked. I have indeed, replied Twain. And let me tell you something. It may be closed season for fishing up here in Maine, but I have a couple hundred of pounds of the finest rock bass you have ever seen iced up in the back car. By the way, who are you, sir? I'm the state game warden. Who are you? Twain replied, oh, pleased to meet you. Who am I? I'm only the biggest liar in, in this part of the United States. Stories like that, you hear all kinds of fishing stories. Yeah. I caught a 12 inch fish, and they point out their arms are stretched out about 36 inches. There's all these fishing stories. All the, you see, going to the stores, and they, they got talking fish, and they got all, you know, everything is, you know, fishing. If you want to have something to fish, they got the bait, they got the fish rod, they got everything you possibly can. And there are some ardent fishermen out there that, by George, they will look to see what the barometric pressure is doing, to see which way the wind is out of it. Is it going to be cloudy or sunny? Or all these atmospheric things. And they really do an effort into fishing for fish. If only we could do that much of an effort to fish for people. But fishing for people is very difficult. It's interesting in our gospel lesson, and it's, you know, Jesus goes after the common people. He goes after the fishermen. He doesn't go after those in the synagogues. These are people who are fishing for their lives. It's their livelihood. And Abraham Lincoln once said, God must have loved the common people. He made so many of them. God uses common people, people like you and I, to try to reach out to people. And Jesus told them two words. He didn't say, worship me. He didn't say, obey me. He said, follow me. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. That was Jesus' task to them, was to make them fishers of people. You know, the primary event for the Christian life is to cast the net, to get the bait, to go outside of the boat to try to reach people. And sometimes we put all of our effort inside the boat that we kind of say, well, you know, if we get everything in order in here, people will want to be a part of our community. They will come to us. That's like asking the fish to jump into the boat for no reason whatsoever. Fish isn't going to do that. Fish is somewhat smarter than that. They know better than to jump into the boat if they don't have to. But they're not smart enough to see the hook on the end of a minnow and they will bite that and then they're, they're done for. But we need to reach out to people. We need to find the right bait. We need to find the right fishing rod. We need to find the right boat. We need to find all kinds of the right stuff to do that. They say, well, you can't 
fish for fish if there are no fish in a lake. If you go to a lake and, well, there's no fish there, you'll hear that. Yeah, don't go fishing over there. There's no fish biting over there. And people will sometimes look at it and say, well, you know, everybody around here has a church home already. Everybody's pretty well taken care of. Everybody's spoken for. One of the interesting facts is that about half of the folks that we know are effectively unchurched. About half. And if you think about it, that is so true. Because how often sometimes do you see people in church? Well, the church gets pretty full at funerals. Maybe a wedding. Maybe Christmas or Easter. You might get a few extra people. Then they're gone. And you don't see them anywhere. Yeah, granted, some of them are strangers from outside the area, but nevertheless, there are locals who will come to those events. So basically, we have to find out when the fish are biting. You have to be able to reach out to them. Be sensitive to changes in people's lives. That's when they are basically looking for something and they don't know what it is. And perhaps we could say, hey, maybe we should bring God into your lives. You know, with God, everything is possible. With God, there is peace. But for us, we don't like to talk about God outside of the confines of the church. If the disciples had that attitude, if Jonah had that attitude, nothing would have ever happened. You must be willing to take that risk and say, bring God into your life. It's not about the church building. It's not even about you coming into the church, but just coming to have a sense of fellowship and a sense of peace and calmness. That's what church is all about. It is about trying to, to bring you in. We don't want to catch you by the nets and bring you in. We just as soon hold your hand and, and bring you in. But I guess if we have to get the fishing net, we'll haul you in one way or the other. <laughs> but people don't like, you know, something about church. They'll go to a basketball game. They'll fill the arenas all the time, but they don't want to come to church. We need something to attract them. Just like to, trying to attract a fish. How do you get a fish? You put a lure on there, or maybe a scrumptious, delicious worm at the end of the fishing rod. Something that will attract the fish. You need a good bait. You know, and they say, well, I've asked so-and-so to come. Why don't you come to church with me? Typical response is, sure. And then nothing ever happens. You need a reason, and they need a reason to come. So the object then is to come up with a reason besides just regular church service. One of the things that I'm hoping we'll be able to do is have special church services. So then we can go and invite people, hey, why don't you come to church? So so and so is speaking, or and we have a special church service this coming Sunday or whatever the case might be, then we can send out an invitation to a specific event. <clears throat> then maybe the people will come. If one time, then maybe there might be a second time or a third time. But you have to create a specialness, something special, because when there's something special, people feel special treat them special, they feel special. We need to look outside of the corporate environment of the church and try to reach the outside of the church. Sometimes we, we look inside the church and say, how come our members are no longer coming? Well, maybe certain things just will not heal over time. 
So then you start looking outside of the corporate of the church into other people to see what will bring them into the church, create a new environment, a new exciting venture, because we all have one mission, and that is to go to heaven, which is why I called my corporation Heaven Bound Ministries, because that's where we want to go. We want to go to heaven. Everybody wants to go to heaven. I mean, after all, if Jonah can convert a whole city, we should be able to convert a few hundred people. Or even 20, as far as that goes. Any number is good. Paul Harvey noted, Too many Christians are no longer fishers of people, but keepers of the aquarium. Kind of kind of a funny way of doing it. There was this couple, the, this boy, his uh, father, and a couple sons, and they were going to go fishing. They rented a cabin. It rained and rained and rained, and they didn't go fishing. They were stuck indoors. And you know what happens inside of, you know, we all cooped up with nowhere to go for a few days. They start getting on each other's nerves. Pretty soon they're fighting. They're almost ready to beat each other up. And that's what happens sometimes. We are no longer worried about trying to catch fish, but we're too consumed in amongst ourselves that pretty soon there gets to be a struggle here and a struggle there and a fight there. We need to concentrate on the greatness of God outside of the church and don't let ourselves be cooped inside the church, staring at each other all the time. Reach out to people. How do we do that? How do we do an outreach program? That's what Jesus is trying to tell us. He says, fish for people. He went after fishermen to try to get fish for people. Billy Graham is about 96 years old and he has Parkinson's disease. In January of 2000, the leaders of Charlotte, North Carolina invited their favorite son, Billy Graham, to a luncheon in his honor. Billy initially hesitated to accept the invitation because he struggles with Parkinson's disease. But the Charlotte leader said, we don't expect a major address, just come and let us honor you. So he agreed. After wonderful things were said about him, Dr. Graham stepped up to the podium, looked at the crowd and said, I am reminded today of Albert Einstein, the great physicist, who this month was honored by Time Magazine as the man of the century. Einstein was once traveling to Princeton on a train when the conductor came down the aisle started punching the tickets of every passenger. When he came to Einstein, Einstein reached into his vest pocket, couldn't find his ticket. He reached into his trouser pockets, couldn't find his ticket. It wasn't there. He opened up his briefcase, no ticket in there. He couldn't find it. He looked in the seat beside him, everywhere. He couldn't find his ticket. The conductor said, Dr. Einstein, I know who you are. We all know who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. Don't worry about it. Einstein nodded appreciatively. The conductor continued down the aisle, punching tickets. As he was ready to move on to the next car, he looked back, and he seen that Dr. Einstein was on his hands and knees looking underneath the seat. The conductor rushes back, Dr. Einstein, Dr. Einstein, don't worry. We know who you are. No problem. You don't need a ticket. I'm sure you bought one. Einstein looked at him and said, young man, I too know who I am. What I don't know is where I am going. Having said that, Billy Graham continued, see the suit I'm wearing? It's a brand new suit. My children and my grandchildren are telling me I've gotten a bit solvent in my old age. 
I used to be a little bit more fastidious. So I went out and I bought a new suit for the luncheon and for one more occasion. You know what that occasion is? This is the suit in which I'll be buried in. But when you hear I'm dead, I don't want you to immediately remember the suit I'm wearing. I want you to remember this. I not only know who I am, I also know where I am going. May your troubles be less, your blessings more, and may nothing but happiness come through your door. Life without God is like an unsharpened pencil. <coughs> it has no points. Even after all those years and <coughs> struggling, Billy Graham has a powerful message. He knows where he is going. Hopefully each one of us also know where we are going. That mission up to heaven. And then on this journey, we're going to be visiting a lot of lakes, trying to find fish. I mean, there's people that will go out to different lakes and, you know, hey, they're fishing over there and they're fishing over there. They don't go over there because the fish aren't biting. We too are going to be fishing for people. And some lakes are going to be dry with no fish, and some might have a couple fish that we can nab. Do nothing, nothing will happen. Make a little effort, <coughs> something will happen. Allow the Spirit of God to work His miracle inside each one of us. Allow the Spirit of God to give us the courage. I allow the Spirit of God to say, you are my son, my daughter, with whom I am well pleased. And then God will say, now go! and catch some fish. Everybody has to have that opportunity to hear the Word of God. The Word of God is peace. Like Billy Graham says, life without God is like an unsharpened pencil. It has no point. If you don't have God in your life, what good is your life? Because then you don't know where you're going. You're going to be like Dr. Einstein. I don't know where I'm going. We need to know where we're going. Following God is not an easy task. You look at the, the disciples. They dropped everything they were doing to follow Jesus. The sons of Zebedee, they left their father in the boat with the hired men. They went and followed Jesus. Jesus says, come and follow me. And they followed him. Andrew... And Simon, they were getting ready to go fishing. Jesus is come and follow me. And they drop what they're doing and follow Jesus. This is a life-transforming event for those individuals. Life-transforming. Ordinary fishermen, ordinary people like me and you say, let's go follow Jesus. If Jesus came through the door and said, come and follow me, we would get up and leave everything behind and follow him. Would we, be, would we be willing to do that? It'd be an adventure. It'd be a challenge. And it probably might shorten your life. But all for the name of God, that's okay. Because up in heaven, we'll be all right. We'll be blessed accordingly. So get out your pencil sharpener. Sharpen your pencils. And make sure that God is at the point of it. Because where God is, there too shall your life be. Amen. <clears throat>